Thanks, Dr. Hamid. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm a little jet lagged. I came in all the way from Santa Monica, so bear with me. Um, and uh, so I'm talking about uh, TIL therapy, uh, adoptive immunotherapy, and then I'm going to touch on a, few, a couple other topics uh, as well um, that are somewhat related to that, I think, uh, as you'll see. Um, but I think uh, throughout the course of the day today, you'll see sort of what an exciting time it's been uh, for melanoma research in, in recent years. Uh, people like Dr. Me, Dr. Carvajal, uh, going into melanoma as your specialty for a medical oncologist um, was a brave thing to do uh, when they did it uh, because things were bleak, I think, uh, for a long time in melanoma, as you'll see, totally different situation now, um, and so it's a very exciting time. I thought since I'm fairly early in the lineup, I'd uh, touch on just a little bit about melanoma, why it's so important. Um, as I get started. So the incidence of melanoma is increasing uh, across uh, the United States and in melanoma at risk populations around the world uh, faster than just about any other cancer, so both in men and women. Um, and the worst group uh, in terms of increasing incidence is young women. And um, we don't know for sure why this is, but one of the likely reasons is tanning. Um, and so whenever you see a, a public interest uh, awareness story on the news about uh, tanning, this is the picture that they show with it, right? Let's find the most attractive young woman we can, put her in a bikini, and then have that as a way of scaring you off from, uh, from tanning. Um, the reality of tanning, it may be more something like this. Um, so this is the woman you may remember from a few years ago who brought her young daughter into the tanning uh, booths with her. This is her in court for child endangerment. Um, and she looks more like a drug addict, right? This looks like one of those meth after pictures, right? Um, and, it's, and it's a real thing because uh, the ultraviolet radiation that goes into tanning, whether it's from the sun or from a tanning bed, um, has similarities uh, to um, an addictive drug. So when the radiation hits the skin, it releases these endogenous opioids, narcotics essentially, um, that um, then make people feel good. So it's not just about looking good, they do actually get this sort of rush. Um, and if you give them one of these anti-addiction medications, uh, they get withdrawal symptoms. Um, and uh, half to two-thirds of frequent tanners uh, would meet the criteria for an addictive disorder. So it's a, it's a real problem um, that is not going away uh, for us, even though there seems to be more awareness uh, in terms of sun protection and the dangers of the sun. Um, so if you do, if you are a tanner, your risk has been documented to go up substantially, especially tanning at a young age, um, and it's a class one carcinogen. Um, you can't get a tan without uh, damage to your skin. Um, so uh, this is this, the surface of the skin. The, the melanoma or melanocytes uh, uh, skin cells are down near the bottom. Um, and the, the reason they produce the tan, the pigment, is that there's damage to these cells above and that damage releases factors that stimulate them to produce uh, the tan. So there's no safe tan. So just something to bear in mind, and Samantha may say more about that later on. Um, in any event, in that context, if you get melanoma, many times it's easily curable with a simple 20-minute operation. Uh, but when it's not, when there's metastatic melanoma, it has been a very, very difficult thing to treat. Um, and so this is a, um, a fairly heavily statistical uh, slide, but it's, it's worth seeing, uh, because what this is is one of the statisticians at the National Cancer Institute um, did an analysis of all of the cooperative group phase two clinical trials that have been done in melanoma uh, over decades. And so what he did here was he plotted out the one year survival, the percent of patients in these trials that were alive at one year into their uh, treatment course, um, and, uh, and then plotted that against the size of the trial. And, and uh, what that allowed him to do was sort of to plot out these curves uh, for what was uh, a real difference and what was just random chance variation in terms of the results of these trials. Um, so that basically anything that falls above this line uh, was a very promising active therapy. There aren't any dots over that line, right? So it was kind of a bleak situation. 
Um, and uh, so this has changed. This is not the world that we live in today. Um, and so if we look at, uh, if we, in an inaccurate way, then lay on some of the current things that are going on that you're going to hear about today onto this, um, these are some of the new drugs, the approved drugs. So this is uh, vemurafenib, uh, and these are two of the groups that got treated with ipilimumab or Eurovoy. So they're well above the line in terms of these statistical probabilities. If we look at what uh, Dr. Kirchhoff is going to talk about, patients that are able to have surgery for their metastatic disease, now it's a selected group, um, but they're above the line as well. Um, and it just keeps getting better and better. So the newest things, uh, the PD-1 drugs, the combination of the vemurafenib and, um, and MEK inhibitors that I'm sure you'll hear more about, um, and then the combination of ipilimumab and PD-1. Um, so this is the world that we live in now, not this world. So it's a different situation. So um, there's st still uh, much more that needs to be done, and one of the things that, that I'm going to talk about is this tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy something that's been in development in, uh, for a number of years, but now it really seems to be catching on and spreading out from a couple of individual centers where it's been uh, looked at and, uh, and really initially developed. So as Dr. Piero pointed out, we, we know um, that uh, immune recognition of melanoma exists, and we know that uh, for the reasons that he said. This is just a, a microscopic image of a melanoma uh, from the skin. And these big brown cells at the top are the melanoma cells. And all these little dark guys at the bottom are lymphocytes. Um, so these are your immune cells. These are the soldiers in that war that he was talking about. Um, and uh, these are, guys are here for a reason. right? They've noticed that something is wrong with these cells, and they've come uh, to attack it. Um, it doesn't happen by accident. So we know the immune system can see the melanoma and react to it, uh, but in some cases, it's not good enough. It can't do the job and get rid of those cells. Um, so when someone has uh, progressive metastatic melanoma, by definition, their immune response has been inadequate. And the idea is we can harness this natural immunity, this uh, patient's ability to recognize their tumor, and potentially boost it so that it is strong enough uh, to kill the melanoma. So I'm going to talk about this adoptive T cell therapy. Um, what how it currently works in the places where it's being used, um, and then some problems with it and how it might be modified uh, to improve on that. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about intralesional immunotherapy. So this harkens back to um, the BCG that Dr. Piero was talking about. I'll talk a little bit about that because there's a lot of interest in that. And that's really, in, in some ways, the same thing, uh, boosting those immune cells that are in the tumor as a way of uh, fighting the melanoma. So tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We know that these uh, lymphocytes uh, that are distributed in the blood and throughout the body can recognize and then in, get to the site of a melanoma tumor. Um, and we know that uh, not only in primary melanomas that you saw, but also in metastatic melanomas, because you can take those tumors out and look at them. Um, and, uh, and you can do s special stains on there and highlight those immune cells. They're all throughout uh, many of these tumors. They're just not doing the job that they're supposed to do. So what you can do is you can take a tumor that you've taken out, take a piece of it, and put it into culture in the laboratory. And you put the conditions of that culture as such that it favors the growth of the immune cells, the lymphocytes that are in there. And so those cells are able to grow and proliferate and uh, become activated. And then in that culture, they can kill the melanoma cells that are in the culture, and they continue to expand. Then what you do is you take those cells out of uh, that and test them against the patient's own melanoma or another melanoma target, and you see uh, which of those cells that you've cultured is able then to recognize and kill melanoma cells in the lab. Those cells then that you've selected that are these effective melanoma killers, uh, you put through what's called a rapid expansion protocol. It's a different set of culture conditions that really logarithmically increases the number of the cells. So you end up with a neighborhood of 50 billion uh, of these melanoma-killing uh, lymphocytes at the end of that. And then those cells are given back uh, to the patients with the metastatic melanoma. Um, and these are some responses from uh, the National Cancer Institute series where this was first done. Uh, scans of, uh, of a patient. This is a, an arm with a big melanoma lesion here that goes away, lung lesions that largely go away and stay away for long periods of time. And here 
even within a month in some cases, the tumors have just disappeared from uh, uh, this liver with the dark spots or as metastases. Um, so it can be uh, very highly and rapidly and durably effective. Um, the trouble is it's tough to do. Um, and the issue is you're doing all of this um, processing and culturing and evaluating of uh, these cells outside of the body. And that has to be done in a way that it's safe and that when you give them back, they're clean and pure and do what you say they're going to do. And so the FDA is fairly stringent about how that can be done uh, so that it can be done safely. Um, it also takes some time to do all of this growing of cells outside of the body. Uh, which is uh, sometimes a difficult thing. You have to be able to document the cells that you have are able to kill the melanoma cells, so that can be tough sometimes to do. Um, and then the way these cells are given, it's given with um, interleukin-2, this one of these cytokines, um, and it's a pretty tough therapy. So not everybody can tolerate that, and that's another challenge for this tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. So in terms of GMP, so this is um, a, um, uh, Google uh, Maps view of the National Cancer Institute. Uh, it's a small city there in, uh, in Bethesda. Um, this is uh, Dr. Wargo's uh, uh, current home at the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Um, these are the types of places where people are doing tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. Um, and they are doing them there because they have these huge infrastructure and, um, and specialized laboratories and, and a lot of resources to be able to do this. So it's only being done at a very small handful of institutions around the world. Um, we are working on doing it here. This is St. John's. This is the John Wayne Cancer Institute across the street. Um, and if we show this to scale, um, <laughs> right. So can this be done outside of a major, um, enormous cancer institute? We don't know for sure, but we think it can. Um, so we have, this is our cell growth uh, facility. It's off limits uh, for, uh, regulatory reasons. Uh, Hitoi Itakura is the um, physician who's uh, leading the laboratory effort for us. Uh, Yui Chin Kwan is one of our technicians. So we have all of the components that we need to be able to do this, and we've actually gone through the process already, taken the tumors, grown the cells, um, de documented their reactivity, and then expanded them into billions and billions of cells. So now we all, have to do, all we have to do is get the FDA to say it's okay for us to start doing it. The timeline is a challenge. So in order to do this, you have to first take out a metastatic tumor from a patient who has stage, generally stage four melanoma. Um, and then to grow out that initial phase to get those cells to begin to grow, it can take two weeks, four weeks, sometimes even longer than that. And then the testing, the evaluation of those cells to see if they can kill melanoma it doesn't take very long. Um, and then this rapid expansion takes a fairly reliable two weeks after that. And so that's a five, six, eight week uh, period of time, um, which if you have stage four metastatic melanoma is a long time. Um, and so there are various ways that uh, people are trying to attempt to shorten that time frame uh, so that people aren't waiting so long to get uh, to get to the therapy. That's going to be one of the challenges though as, as the therapy moves forward. Documenting reactivity can be a challenge as well. So you have to take these lymphocytes and culture them with melanoma cells in the lab and see if they're able to kill them or not. And uh, so there, there are issues with that. Uh, one of the issues is that it's sometimes, the toughest part is actually finding the right target. So you have to have a tumor cell that's appropriate for that patient. And it's best if it's their own tumor cells, which is often possible, but not always, based on the amount of tissue you can get. Um, you can have surrogate uh, cell lines that you can use as a way of trying to get at whether there's reactivity there or not. Uh, but you clearly have patients where you're able to grow these cells. They look like it, they're great cells. You just can't f demonstrate that they're able to kill melanoma cells or that patient's melanoma cells. And many patients then don't go on to receive the cells back again because they can't, you just can't prove that we have cells that'll, that'll kill their melanoma. Um, so actually there, there are now trials that have been done that look at not testing this. And you can, even if you can't document reactivity, you get responses in some of those patients as well. And there may be other ways um, uh, to demonstrate that you have the right cells. Um, one, one possibility is to use what's called transgenic T cells. Um, and so here, instead of having to take out a tumor, you just take out some of these lymphocytes from the blood. So just with a, a, a 
process called leukophoresis. You remove white blood cells, just lymphocytes from the circulation, and then take those cells to the lab. And what you do there is you insert into them a gene uh, that codes for a specific receptor on their surface. And all lymphocytes are very, very specifically targeted. They only react to one thing. That's a, their whole job in life for any given cell, one target. And so you can program these cells to recognize a specific melanoma target and then just expand those cells that you've created that are melanoma um, specific um, and give those back so they get the receptor and then they go back. And um, the trouble is it's too specific, it seems. So they've done this and um, unfortunately the response rates are not as high as you might expect. So there are other ways potentially of modifying this transgenic approach and one you may have heard about, you may have picked up the copy of uh, the Science Journal. Anybody? No? So maybe the New York Times then. Um, uh, so this is now uh, the latest thing that's been reported with this adoptive immunotherapy where um, in a patient actually with a non-melanoma cancer, which has been impossible for anybody to treat in this way before, they've actually sequenced, um, they've taken out part of the tumor and they've done whole genome sequencing on it so they found out all of the um, uh, mutations that are in that tumor um, and identified ones that are uh, targetable by, the, uh, by an immune response. Then they look at these cells, the lymphocytes they've grown out of that tumor, and see which ones are able to recognize this specific mutation. And then in this patient that they reported on in the New York Times, they gave her back first a group of cultured cells that 25% of them recognized this, and her tumor stopped growing. And then they were able, to, based on the time they had bought doing that, to in, grow more cells, give her back now cells that had 95% recognition of this uh, specific mutation that's personalized in her tumor. And, uh, and now her tumors are shrinking and, and under control. Um, so this, you know, five years ago would have been a ridiculous thing to even think about, um, to think that you're gonna sequence an entire genome of a patient Right, the first human genome that was sequenced took a decade and a billion dollars, right, to, uh, uh, to get that sequencing. Now, it's, whole genomes can be sequenced much more completely even than that first thing in a matter of two or three days for a few thousand dollars. Um, and so this actually becomes potentially a practical way of approaching these things, of really parsing out what's going on for every individual um, and designing a therapy specific, specifically for them. So um, I'm gonna move over now to the intralesional therapies, which is the same sort of concept, but, uh, but done in a, in a different way. Um, and that's taking advantage of these cells that we know that are in there already and activating them while they're still in place uh, inside the patient. Um, and so um, the tumor as it sits there is an ideal target. Um, it's matched to that particular patient, it's theirs. Um, so there's no problem with compatib compatibility. It has all of the targets that you could want in any uh, given tumor. Um, and we have tumors in melanoma often that are available for their um, conditions to be manipulated uh, so that we can tip the balance in favor of the immune system within an individual tumor and that then may spread to other parts of the body. So this is not a new idea. Um, this is uh, Bradford, William Bradford Coley, uh, who was a sur surgeon in New York, at one of the forerunners to Dr. Carvajal's institution. Um, and he saw a patient that had a, uh, an unresectable sarcoma um, and developed an infection just on, on their own. They developed an infection on top of this. And the tumor went away. Um, and uh, that made him think, well, what happened with this infection? So what did he do is he grew up these bacterial uh, cultures um, and purified down toxins and then injected the toxins from these bacterial cultures into patients, into their tumors. Um, and uh, it was a, it's a curious thing when you read these reports about how they did this, they would, the way they figured out the dose is they give it until the patient had a fever of 102 or 103 degrees, and they knew that was enough then. Uh, so it was pretty heavy duty stuff, um, but they did see these tumors regress, and this is one of his initial patients uh, that had an unresectable sarcoma. They, this is after a series of injections where the tumor had stabilized. This is uh, a number of years later where the tumor had largely gone away. Um, and so he had some successes. The problem was they didn't know what was going on. They couldn't make it standardized. And it didn't work for enough people. They were looking for a cure for everybody they treated every time. And that wasn't gonna happen. 
Um, so Coley kept doing this uh, for a long time, but it didn't catch on outside of uh, just his own uh, practice. So in the modern era, uh, so my mentor, Don Morton, uh, started doing injection to PCG that Dr. Piero mentioned uh, when he was at the National Cancer Institute and, uh, and reported it after he moved out here to the West Coast. And in this initial series, uh, they injected into uh, melanoma lesions in the skin, small uh, nodules in the skin and often develop in patients with melanoma. 90% of those lesions that they injected went away, and then other lesions that they didn't inject went away at the same time, uh, suggesting that there was some sort of immunization taking place uh, that made the tumors they weren't directly <coughs> treating go away. Um, and so this became a very exciting thing in the 70s and early 80s, um, but the way this was given back then, the doses were too high, and um, and there were some substantial toxicities that came along with it. Um, and so it fell by the wayside uh, just about everywhere, except John Wayne. Um, and uh, so it, as part of this excitement, there were reports of even regression of um, not only uninjected lesions, but internal lesions. So this was sort of the state of the art back, uh, back then uh, in terms of evaluating the inside of the body, a chest x-ray. Um, and this is a patient who had skin lesions injected. And you can see that uh, here on day one, here's the tumor that they saw on the chest x-ray. On day 80, it grows, but then by uh, day 248, it's shrinking and then it goes away. Um, and so this is the plot of, uh, on a graph of how big the tumors are. And it goes up and then it goes down. Um, and this is incredibly um, familiar uh, to the oncologists in the audience because if you look at these Yervoy responses, some of them, you have initial growth, as Dr. Pirro showed, and then it goes away. And look, it's like the same curve all over again. It's pretty amazing. Um, so this is a phenomenon that we've seen before with immune therapies. We just know more about those immune therapies now, so we may be able to um, manipulate things better for better advantage generally. So this is just an example of one of the patients that has gotten BCG. Um, she came down from Anchorage and uh, had all of these uh, spots or melanoma. She even has some out on, on the outside of her ankle. Uh, so we injected those with BCG and she got quite a brisk response as you can see. These aren't painful even though they look somewhat painful. Um, and then everything goes away and she's left with these scars at the uh, BCG injection sites. Um, but all of the injected ones and the inje uninjected ones go away and this is on that outside of, of her ankle uh, tumors that we never injected, and here they are at the beginning, this cluster, and they just shrivel up and go away. We don't know why or how or what's going on in there, but, uh, but something's going on. Um, this is another example, uh, a woman who had a melanoma uh, back here and developed a field of intransits, uh, these metastases here and here and all down her thigh, and we injected the, some of those as well, and you can see some of them get red we biopsied this here, and our pathologist told us there was still melanoma there, so we did some more injections in other sites, um, and then um, eventually did a biopsy of this injected lesion, and there was no more melanoma there. And the pathologist said, oh, well, let's go back and look at that other one that we did from a few weeks ago, and there was no melanoma in that way, actually, when they went back and looked at it again. So then we biopsied um, one of the lesions that we hadn't injected up here, and it was just pigment. There was no melanoma left in it. And so now she continues on with the vast majority of her tumors we never injected and they've just gone away. Um, so we've looked back at our BCG patients that we treated this way and we've treated a lot of them this way now. So there are about 600 of them all together. And we looked at it broadly at a big group and then uh, more narrowly and more detail at others to see about what about this toxicity that was a problem in the past and, and how are things working. So the toxicity now in much lower doses that we use is very, very manageable. They get the injection site reactions that you saw. Uh, some people will get fever, redness around the in, uh, injection site, but it's generally pretty manageable. We had one patient who got sick from the BCG, but that was an immunosuppressed patient who we probably should not have treated with BCG just based on that immunosuppression. Um, but people tolerate it pretty well generally. Um, if you're able to develop an immune response against the BCG as measured by a skin test, you do much better in terms of long-term survival here at 10 years uh, than if you don't. If you don't have, have mount an immune response against the BCG, it doesn't work so well. It doesn't matter how many lesions there are, so actually the people in our series that had a bunch of lesions did better than the people that just had one or two for reasons we don't fully understand. 
Um, but it's definitely a, a, a viable approach even now, and so we use it very commonly on our patients. Uh, but we know much more about the immune system now, and so this same approach of using the tumor as a weapon against itself um, is being developed in other ways. And so there's another trial that we're a part of uh, that's using a sort of a gene therapy as an interlesional therapy where you inject a, a, a vector, a gene, um, into a melanoma tumor, and then you do what's, uh, so here's the, here's the gene, um, and then you do what's called electroporation. So there's another device that we have that has uh, probes on it, and you stick those probes down into the tumor, and that applies a brief pulse of an electrical uh, uh, current to the, uh, to the tumor, and that doesn't, the electric uh, uh, pulse doesn't kill the tumor. Uh, what it does is for any given tumor cell, when you apply that pulse, it makes the membrane become destabilized briefly. Um, and what that does is it allows you to get the gene that you have into the cell, so then the cell makes the thing that you want it to make. In this case, it, it makes an immune um, uh, protein called interleukin-12. Um, and so that, uh, that is now in a phase two trial that we're doing. It's led by um, UCSF and Adil Dowd up there. Um, and so they've treated several patients up there. And you see these same sorts of very slow, uh, but clear regression of, uh, of the melanoma tumors on the skin. Um, there are a bunch of other things that have been done in, a, in the same sort of way with interferons, uh, with uh, topical cream and miquimod, um, with interleukin-2, which is uh, an approved treatment for melanoma systemically, but here injected into tumors. Um, our institution has developed monoclonal antibodies that can be injected into, um, into melanoma tumors, and then one that's probably been uh, developed most um, completely from a drug development standpoint is a virus, an oncolytic virus, um, that uh, is injected into tumors. And so it's a modified herpes virus that's attenuated, so it can't make you sick, uh, but it can grow inside of tumor cells. And so they've, uh, they've gotten rid of some of the bad components of the virus, and then it gets injected into the tumor, um, and then it kills the tumor cells, since viruses can kill cells. And as a side effect also, they made it so that it produces another immune hormone, basically GMCSF, that can hopefully boost an immune response. So this has now been through a phase three trial, and one of those ones where half the people get it and half the people don't, um, so that uh, you can see what it's really doing. And uh, it was well tolerated. There are some side effects uh, to it, but they're um, pretty manageable and, and low grade, so people did fine uh, with this treatment. They had good responses in many of the patients, so this is melanoma that's then gone away. Um, and they see responses not only at the sites where they've treated, but at internal sites as well. So this is a PET CT scan uh, with two liver metastases that go away in the context of this treatment. So it improves the time to, uh, to disease progression and actually improves overall survival, which was sort of a surprise, or it's very close to improving overall survival. Um, and so it has this whole body benefit by treating a tumor locally. So now we have all these choices, all these different things that, um, that are available to be used. How do we combine them? So just a quick, easy example of how we've combined two of these things, BCG that we know a lot about, and then topical amiquimod. You can get it at the drugstore. It's uh, approved for warts and keratoses and other things. So we put those two things together, and we see, uh, we've seen very, very good responses. This is a woman from Palm Springs who had had melanoma excised and then excised again and then radiation and lost her hair and had a recurrence despite that. So we treated her with this combination of these two things and all our tumors have gone away. They've still gone away now, 10 years later. Um, another patient, 95-year-old, uh, pretty advanced melanoma on his arm uh, when he presented. Uh, so we treated with the same sort of combination and then over a fairly dur durable period of time, his tumors all go away. Um, and he was fine now living out in Vegas, and uh, he died at the age of 99 of pneumonia uh, with no melanoma. So we, we have to figure out how this works. We don't know how it works. Dr. Lee, who is at our institution, who Dr. Morton brought in, is working in the lab trying to figure out how this stuff works and then how we can improve it over time with other combinations. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.